first? Um, I feel like I'll do whatever you want. I mean, I far be it for me to go before Stefan. I, I wouldn't feel right. Uh, I defer to you, Stefan and Bill, however you guys want to do it. I'm just here to just whatever you guys want to use me. How, how's your depth perception, Riley? Uh, mm-hmm, you know, <laughs> I can't actually say that he's... <laughs> Is this being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let's get going. So, uh, Stefan, we'll have you present your cases first as, you know, somebody wants to be deferential. Robert, I'm going to warn you right now, Ref- Rinfrey has world-class Kanzari disease. So we'll see how time goes. Okay, okay. Uh, I got, like, I, I got plenty of crap. I mean, okay. as you really, know. Really, you're Thank rolling you. all this, keep your mic open. This, you probably don't know what Kenzari disease is. Yeah, I know he does. what it is. <laughs> Bill. Yeah. Everybody yeah, I think we Kenzari all know what that is. is. All right. Uh, so, John Michael, can we open up? We are open. You can in, do introductions. We'll get rolling. Are we rolling? Is the world watching us now? 18 count. All right, we have to we have to behave ourselves, boys. All right, well, I'd like to thank everybody tonight, uh, Cases Over Cocktails. I don't know about the rest of the crew, but I picked a nice uh, Pride Cabernet for the evening. I hope you all have your favorite choices. Um, Tonight, we're gonna do a discussion on coronary complications. And the concept around this is to look at sort of the psychology of how complications affect us and also how they affect our ability to learn and get better at the craft. Um, The second piece is that many of the operators out there will have one or two complications a year or one a year, and it's really hard to be up to date on what's going on. And so the idea is Stefan and Robert Riley are going to help us see a few more things and think about it a different way. And I've got the Grandmaster Psychologist, Dr. Nicholson, who is going to help us with sort of the mental piece of this. So one, I'd like to really appreciate Emery allowing us to have two of their faculty, Bill Nicholson, the director of the program, and Stefan Rinfrey, who just moved there. I can't say how great it is for interventional cardiology to see Emory's program reestablishing itself as a great coronary program with you two guys leading. And we're also blessed to have Robert Riley, who I had the honor of either training to become a great operator or psychologically terrorizing to give him a little PTSD for the rest of his life. And Robert is joining us from the Christ in Cincinnati, where he has really helped bring that program out in a variety of different ways doing high-risk PCI. So guys, I really appreciate you joining us tonight. And I think Stefan will just start by, let's show a case and Robert, Billy or myself, you guys have things to say, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what we're thinking about, what the options are and how we might learn from each other's emotionally enriching experiences so that we can do a better job taking care of patients. Uh, <clears throat> that's a great in- introduction, uh, Bill, because it's all about uh, how we can learn all together. I'm gonna start sharing my, my screen uh, right now. And there you go. Do you guys see this right now? Is, are we all good? You see my, my slides? We, we got gotcha. you. Super. It's almost like, I don't know, like in this old COVID time, like uh, I always like feel that I have to validate everything that people are seeing or not. So anyway, <clears throat> this is, I call that adventure and post cabbage heart. Uh, because I think it's really what uh, <clears throat> what is the most difficult situation to manage on uh, on a human standpoint and on operator standpoint. And uh, I hope that some of my learn some of the the learning and, and those this these learning were from from you know failures and stuff that could benefit the people who are listening tonight. Yes, Stefan, I'll, I'll just, I, I, I will interrupt there, which is one is the thing I appreciate and the reason we had each of you on 
is your willingness not to just show heroic events, but also to show that you're human and bad things can happen, how we manage it. And I think also I would say is a lot of the, like this, we're showing an epicardial collateral perforation and there's a lot to go with it, but you can almost look at this also as a distal vessel perforation. They're very similar algorithms, but I do think this, it takes a lot of courage to, to present at these things, but I think it gives so much value to the rest of us to learn from it. So I appreciate that, Stefan. No, uh, no problem. Uh, you know, in the end, it's the objective is I, I hope that with the presentation, people will understand a bit better fa factors associated with collateral perforation with, with post cabbage patient, and also understand the factors um, with epicardial, how to manage, and the nuances with a wire in place and without a wire in place. First case is a 72 year old male post cabbage. <clears throat> it was 10 years before the PCI. Peyton Lima to LED SVG to OM, included SVG to RCA. RCA is a CTO, class three angina, good medical therapy, very, uh, you know, and basically a very common situation that we see in day to day practice, which is post cabbage and failed grafts. So just to start, this is just a tip of a tip and trick. If you're coming right radial and your catheter is folding, just take it. And afterward, what you need to do is a guide deflector. The guide deflector is the back end of your whole 35 wire and then you get into the catheter. This is the, 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 the left main. This is a, a triple axis. I like to do it when you have, you know, uh, uh, biplane is a, sees this RCCTO, but has, uh, not really interventional laterals coming from the uh, AV groove circ. Bit of ambiguity, proximal, few septals. So um, there you go. You see the septals right there. It's not, it's not from hip injection. So I got into the septals. Uh, you could see it seems to connect and very easily with, uh, with a Xi'an, uh, I was able to connect uh, without any trouble. So got an LP and the LP got stuck. And we've all had that. Like we're trying, we're thinking that smaller catheter cross better. But what do urological, urologists do when a Foley doesn't go in with a small Foley? Do they use a smaller one or a bigger one? A bigger one. You say, dude, I don't know a lot about that because I stopped doing it like med school. One year, I did one year. And I, did and I can see Nicholson years. looking, going, "What the hell are you talking about?" But the point is that I did one year. You, you mean Stefan, the only one who still straight casts himself? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point is that when you, a small catheter doesn't go, you don't need to go smaller. You know, you need to go bigger. So now. I got the Corsair and I'll go through this because it's not the teaching point. It was a tough case. I got a pilot to hundred, I'm there. Uh, and these are the, the adventure of post cab, but you're knuckling. And then at some point with the biplane, look at the left, you feel like yeah, it's not really dancing and the catheter is a bit more distal. And the experience out of you know what's going on. I'm tracking a damn graft all the time. And this is the issue with post cabbage. I pulled back, I did the wires not in the RCA, and then I did a bit of cardino to try to understand. Say, so come on, I mean, it must be able to track that graft. This is, I must be in the RCA. Come on, it's over. I'm gonna just knuckle and just gotta go. Got a guy, uh, I'm not really in the RCA. Look at how it doesn't dance with the calcium on the on the right panel. So you know that the, the wire is not there. Pull back, different view, looks good. And this is a beautiful knuckle. And I want you to show like, I wanna show like the perfect knuckle going in anyone's mind in the RCA, right? But biplane is very interesting because it's it's again into the- the, 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 the say that knuckle looks a little funny. Yeah, you got it. 
So the old graph, so the way to solve this when you're always distal and getting it on the graph, you got to solve it integrate. So the, the primary reason that was retrograde is because there was a lot of ambiguity proximal. So I knew it would be an adventure. So I based the proximal RCA, got a pot of 200, get into it, try to cardino a bit because I couldn't get anything, a bit of tattoo in the proximal right. But all, at some point I was able to leave the wire there, do a parallel wire with the horn at 14. And then uh, afterward, got the micro catheter and knuckled down. But I really had a big, big problem with this graph that was in this mode right where I wanted to do that. I just didn't get beyond that graph in any direction. So with anything I would do, I just couldn't overlap my retrograde system, my integrate system. Like I haven't done as many retro as Bill, but probably done quite a lot. And just can't overlap my retrograde gear to my integrate gear. But you know, at some point I said like, yeah, okay, that's okay. Done, done with this mess. Just start the PL, got into the PLV. Then I said like, okay, with this, I will be able to connect into from, from the right. And it was absolutely impossible to connect from the PDA to the right, connecting this dissecting, ballooning, all the things. But at some point, what I ended up doing, I'll skip this. I was able to get the micro catheter integrate. Guess what I did? I just start the PDA. So start a PDA from the proximal, got it. So I've started PL, started PDA from proximal segments, felt that I re-entered re re relatively proximal, removed the Corsair, and here's what I get. So you all now see something going around the PDA right there. And just did a little puff. There is a sort of an hematoma that's big, but for some, some of us, I mean, it's septal hematoma. Let's move on and let's see how it goes. Because I got to like Stephon, so Stephon, what are you, so when you're thinking septal hematoma, right? So some people say not a big deal. Some people say big deal. What are you worrying about right now in your head as you decide whether you're going to stent this guy and how you're going to manage it? What's the, what's your fear factor right now? My fear factor is, is um, the location of that perforation. It's not basal. It's more, it's more towards the apex of the heart. And I'm wondering if it could be messing around the RV. Okay. So, so this is my first guess. And I'm sort of thinking maybe what I thought to be a septal at a non-septal course at some point and add some RV superficial course or whatever. So I'm okay. I feel I have a good flow as I feel I have all the septals. And I think like in these cases, you're okay. A balloon and this is after ballooning. This is the... That's okay. getting entertaining, isn't it? It's getting a bit big. I don't like it. I decided to stand the RCA. Just yeah, it's getting big. My gut feeling is not good about this. I have, you know, some, and I have. It's difficult for me right now to, to to say why I didn't like this, but I didn't like it. Pressure was good. Patient as a, as a BP over 160. I've got no paradoxical no chest pain. So I asked for an echo. And you can see, right, the RV is right there. You can see this hematoma just at the junction of the RV and the LV. So the RV is there. And you can see this opening during systole. It's, I mean, it's, it's not subtle, 
you see it. You see it on echo. So right. it's, it's not small. And this is really, your RV is coming here. And this is really at the junction. So therefore I took a septal that was really at the distal edge of the RV. I got this, another view of it. So I decided to call it. So BP is around more 100 at that time. Let me, and let me interrupt you, Stefan. Like when, when you look at these septal hematomas, like the sequelae that you worry the most about, you know, would be chamber uh, encroachment. Uh, it would be LV alpha track obstruction and potentially uh, arrhythmogenic, you know, and, and so this is, this is distal, which is nice, you know, so you're not uh, where you're going to end up with alpha obstruction and so forth. Um, I guess, I guess I have two questions about this that I'd be curious to hear Rob and Bill's uh, opinion on. One, when do you all stent starring? you know, because you've starred and, and Stefan elected to stent here. And, and that's a tough decision that we all run into to determine when you're going to actually stent the vessel versus doing, leaving it as an investment procedure to come back for. But two, if you're going to treat this septal hematoma, which I think one important point to make is the vast majority do not need anything. But if you're going to treat it, if it's uh, captured or encapsulated, like Bill referred to, maybe coiling is a very bad idea. Yes, so, what? so Stefan, so I, I, or Robert, why don't I ask you, so we'll talk about, there are two different kinds of hematoma. One's in the septum, one's actually in the myocardium outside of the septum. In your head, how do you divide those two and how, how do you determine whether you're going to treat them or not treat them? You know what sure. it's, Oh, yeah. go ahead. Okay, you, hang on, Stefan, I'll, I'll let's Robert, Robert take a shot at this, then we'll get to you. We know what you know what's going to happen. So, we're playing the game. <laughs> yeah, we're playing a very fun game. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is please don't die game. game. So the, the the term, you know, as as you talked about, the sort of dry tamponade. It's been called a couple of different things. Sort of where the RV gets really boggy is typically when we get acute marginal impingement. Which again, if you look at the data out of our friends out of Amsterdam, a large CMR registry showing that. Typically, when we cut off acute marginals, it actually doesn't lead to any hemodynamic impingement. That being said, there's too many individual operators' experiences where that's just not the case. Sometimes people get really sick, and that's this whole boggy RV, dry tamponade, whatever you want to call it. And I, there is nothing other than support and weight, and typically it's not great. Then there's this other idea that, that Bill's talking about with the septal hematoma, where we get we get impingement upon the septal cascade as it comes through. And in particular here, where you talk about the meat, you know, sort of we get to the septal as it sort of makes that bend. You know, this is where we start to get edema filling that, that, that septum. And at least I think from what I saw on the echo images, it looked like it started to bulge and impinge on the RV filling. So during diastole, it looked like the RV wasn't able to fill. It's almost a little bit like tamponade in some ways. And, and, and so you're probably getting a drop in your blood pressure just because you're not getting filling pressure, right? It's almost like an RV infarct in some ways. Your RV is just not getting the chance <laughs> to fill. Um, and so, you know, as Nicholson already said, you know, treating a septal perf is like, hopefully once in a lifetime for even high volume CTO operators, maybe a couple of times, but we do it so often and we've seen such little consequence that you'd have to push me down a mountain to do something about this. The other issue that I worry about is, is let's say you, you really do push me and, and, I, and I say, okay, you've shown me something cardiographically, hemodynamically that I've got to treat it. Then the question is, what am I actually going to do? So first and foremost, it's your ABCs, right? You're just going to give this patient's fluid uh, until their neck veins pop, because that's what they need in the moment. And they may need a little bit of SVR improvement as well, just to get some increased preload. Because again, you just got to stent that RV open. And assuming their LV function is normal, which, which hopefully you knew before the case, you know, you're going to be able to get that back. Then the next question is, well, how do you stop the bleed? And so I'm not going to lie, my first gut reaction sort of recoiled a little bit to coils, um, just because you're going to put a foreign object in the septum and the arrhythmogenic consequences of that not going away do concern me, although I, I can't say one's right or wrong. I just, I guess my first thought was, do I have other options like fat, like thromb, something else that may have another diffusion um, possibility down the line as opposed to coils, although you might not, right? If it's big enough, you can inject fat all day and it's just, it's just not going to, it's just not going to do anything. So um, 
I hope that answered your question, Bill, but it's a very interesting proposition. How do you actually do this in a long-term way? Yeah, it's so just Stefan, quite, because it, if, you, if you start to, whatever you choose to coil it or stop it with, you, you've, you've bought the hematoma at that point because now you've closed it. So, yeah. so yeah. Stefan, in your head- do That's you, a good you, point too, Bill. I, I guess in my head, as I look at this, right, I'm thinking, is this an RV failure issue or an RV compression issue? Because yeah. I think those are two different algorithms you have to start thinking about managing. So in your head, Stefan, you were thinking about compression, it well, looks like. You're thinking about coiling, right? Right now, I'm not talking about RV compression because okay. when I look at it, it seems to be located in the, into the, the septum. It okay. doesn't seem to encroach the RV at all. Okay. But so I, why is it getting hypotensive? Yeah, that's the question you have to ask yourself is why in is it getting my, hypotensive? In my, and it's... You know, I, I, if you haven't seen the movie Sully, we I encourage every CTO operator to see that movie. It, it's calling about the human factor and how this guy who, who flew his plane over the Hudson and, and landed courageously was pulled into a trial to say, you could have brought the plane to LaGuardia, and there was enough time for you to fly the plane to LaGuardia. But the reality is that by the time he, re he realized that everything was going on, seconds had been taken that there was no more time to get to LaGuardia. And the only thing he could do was Hudson. So I'm thinking it's, it's always like when we're looking back at a case and you realize what's going on, when making decisions, that are much faster and when looking back than the, 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 the timing we're making the decision when we're forward into it. So I just just want to keep you, keep this in mind. So- No, and, and Stefan, I think, honestly, Stefan, I think for everybody watching, that is one of the things when we talk about complication management, right? It's really easy for all of us sitting here calmly on a, Tuesday evening, having a glass of wine, hanging out with our friends to tell you what we think and what you could do. It's an entirely different thing when somebody's sitting on a table, the blood pressure is going down, you're not exactly sure what's going on and you have to make some real time decisions. And so I think your, your analogy to Sully is incredibly important. It's really easy for people to set Monday morning quarterback. It's a lot harder to do it in real time. Yeah, And I think that's, one of the things when I was trying to ask the question is just a little bit is for me to learn from you is what were you thinking? Yeah. Because uh, my thinking the situation, what should I be thinking and what do I learn from it? And I would say the, the one thing I would say too is that the, the hematoma, you know, honestly, I, the hematoma, because you, you don't have RV encroachment and the RV is good. What, what bothers me the most mm -hmm. about the picture that you're showing right now is not the hematoma, it's the contrast underneath your wire. Uh, that's uh, collecting. That's exactly what I had in mind. Oh, is this one of those sneaky ones? It's going not in, it's going out, isn't it? It's that distal it's, septal it's, into the pericardium. You'll see, you'll see over time what's going on. Okay. I took the decision to coil and I'm mm -hmm. in a good position. The coiling is, is, is not, you know, it's not rocket science. I got I got isolated both extremities. I isolated, I coiled from both sides. And just look at the heart. It's, it's, I call that the less vigorous heart. You know, when you see the heart that was like moving, the, the, the heart seems constrained. The pressure is still okay, but it's not the same kind of movement you see on the heart. Hmm? I don't know how to say it, but I didn't like what I was seeing and I was happy at this point I'd coil it wrong or not. So we'll come back to this afterward. So finish blood pressure is 100, 110. It was running in 160 all the time. It's okay, guys on the floor and then gets hypotensive. Uh, 90 chest pain, worse on inspiration, phenylephrine. So we don't like that. Echo is done. Everybody's calling me in a disaster. And that's, this is just what you see from a dry tamponade. The RV free water, it's just filled with blood. Like, 
got a lot of blood into the RV free wall. And uh, can, the, I just, can I just say these terrify me? Oh yeah. Because they're, they're not outside, they're inside the muscle, right? They're in the muscle. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the RV is a bit dilated. You saw the- Hey, the, 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 Stefan, I, Stefan yeah. I want you to ask, so there's a chat saying, no, what you're seeing is the, and Stephen Harbo is great. He's in Europe. I want to say Switzerland or, or Austria. I can't remember which. But he's talking about you're seeing the heart contour while it's getting surrounded by pericardial fluid. Oh. Austria. Sorry, Stefan. Thank you. But this is actually, it's not surrounded. Part of it's outside the heart, but part of it's in the heart, right? Oh, yeah. Part of it's in the muscle. This is... This is a thickening of the RV free wall. Right. So is it inside the RV or is it sub endocardial? Uh, endocardial, right? Yep. So so that's what we uh, so the the IVC sturgescent on that view doesn't look that bad. But this is the apical view and it doesn't look good. Like it's all loculated. Okay. And the heart is moving, like you see, you, you feel constrained and ring. So obviously with all this, I'm wondering, do I still have a bleeder that I missed? Do I, do I have anything? Is it the RV that burst? Is it something? So I, just, I almost think you saved his life by doing, putting in the uh, coils early. Yeah, but because you know what? The problem with a lot of these hematomas is we don't recognize them and they keep extending. And then the, the whole ventricle goes to mush. But you know what? I I still don't know, Bill. I will be honest to you. Uh, Neither still, do I, man. So I brought this guy back to the lab. I did an RV gram, an LV gram. There's no leak. Okay. I shot the, R, the, the, the RCA, no leak. Shot the left, no leak. So I said, like, there's no active bleeding. It must, it's, there's no active bleeding. It's, a, it, it's like it just the septal hematoma that just burst out and then progress. And all of a sudden, after some time, the BP started to increase in the room. And during that time, I had like, sorry, I skipped this, 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 okay. uh, this slide. I had three different opinions from three different surgeons. One wanted to put an, R, an impeller RP, wanted to open up, and the other one said, wait, because it's, uh, it's okay, it's kind of stuff. So BB, the, the blood pressure started to increase, and then at some point, someone said, you want me to run the, the Levo at the same rate because 100 is, and all of a sudden, it just improved, and we basically kept the guy in house. This is is echocardiogram two days later, which you see the RV is still puffy, but the LV got better. And uh, basically I'll show you some longer term outcome. This is the LV getting much vigorous, improved with the short gym. And then we brought him three months so, later. So Stefan, I missed that. It, so it ruptured, do you think, into the RV? It ruptured into the pericardial uh, at, because it, the it was at the junction of okay. of the septum, it ruptured in the pericard in the pericardium right there. I don't know if my coil forced it. Well, this is the question. I don't I don't know. Is right. it because I I plugged the two holes that this thing had to burst this way? And if I'd let Mother Nature to do, it would have been okay. But if it had burst without coiling, the guy would be dead. So I just don't know. And I still don't know. And I still what, don't know what I would do. Very interestingly, I want you to show you what a coil in a septum does. It does what you expect to do. It caused an infarction right at the septum right there. And this is, uh, I can't the guy. And you're all talking about standing. And we should never stand. When you have good outflow, I think it's just okay to stand too. So we got like all both branches because you were all asking, 
should we just defer all the time? But if you got good all flow and you're, you're sure that we, you re-entered proximal enough, I'm not all the time 100% sure that we have to defer stenting in some, some cases. In this case, I was sort of a bit like in another mindset. I just wanted to get things done yeah. and move to dealing with is a uh, life-threatening issue. This is the left system. Uh, everything was fine. So I think we've already discussed all of these is that did coning make it better or worse? Like the trapped hematoma forcing it to pop out or uh, did it prevent it, not present it, prevent it further bleeding given the in in inevitable perforation evacuation of the hematoma that would have happened anyway. That's the thing that I, I don't know. Because if you think that it would not have popped out, I made it wor worse. But if it, it was out to pop out because it's fed by the two, the two in flow and it at some point would have popped out into the pericardium, coilin made it a big difference. And is coilin the right way? And should we try to find a more controlled evacuation of hematomas and septum? like going into it, perfing into our VLV, is coining the right thing to do. I'm, I'm opening the question, but I'm, I'm not even sure what I did, but it did, it did save this guy. It did work. I'm not sure what I did, but was what it was the right thing to do. Did I make him sicker? But in the end, the guy survived. So you can't argue with survival, however, you still have to ask yourself if it was more chance than what you did. That's what I do. So Nicholson, yeah. luck, thoughtful, who the hell knows? We have lots more to learn. Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, it's a, it's a great case and it's a great awesome. discussion. Uh, you know, I think there's a couple of things that would go through my mind with this. And, and if you had uh, a septal hematoma that was uh, encroaching or impinging on a cavity, I'd be very reserved about coiling that because I think now you've 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 trapped that. So here's a situation where you don't have that situation where you're more worried about the hemodynamic compromise and you're more worried about the bleeding. So I think the coiling's fine here. Uh, I think if you had a situation like uh, Dimitri had once uh, years ago where it basically it was a mistake obliterated the right ventricle. I think coiling in that situation is a mistake because you've just bought that now for the next however long it takes for that hematoma to hopefully resolve. I think in those situations, you probably need to think about uh, unroofing the hematoma and, and allowing an outflow to it. The other thing with this too, is I think you probably, we've, I've had a number of these where you, you end up with the RV kind of gets this kind of football kind of glistening appearance on the outside of it. And, uh, you know, most of those people will get through with just uh, fluids and, and support. Balloon pump surprisingly works. It's probably maybe the one place that might actually do something. But uh, I've had a case too where I did a protect duo on this, which is I think is probably the the most guaranteed way that you're going to continue to to feed uh, past the the RV issue and and not very hard to do. But it's a tough call, you know. And <clears throat> I think if you're gonna if you're gonna coil it, uh, you just want to make sure you're not buying a ventricular compromise over the next uh, you know seven days or ten days. So, so, so I'm going to interpret for you, Billy. I think what you're saying is if you're going to coil coil early, not yep. late. Yep. And I think that's Stefan did this early, right? Yep. I think so it's an know, overdriving message with, with bypass patients too. I have, yeah, that's, that's I have, my message here. is that I, you know, sometimes you have to follow your guts. This, you know, it's not the first septal hematoma I've seen. This one didn't feel okay with it. There were other factors and I'm sort of trying to you know, sometimes you have a gut feeling, but you have to sort of analyze, you know, mindset is, is we see factors that sometimes we take time to, to, to dissect and make it as real factors that you can actually measure. This is the art of medicine. The art of medicine is being with experience, you feel something wrong here. And it's so difficult sometimes to turn into a criteria. But sometimes when you have a feeling that it's not right, my message is just sometimes it's okay to follow your guts. If you feel it's not right, it's not right. 
I tell you, without without the hemodynamic compromise, though, just so the message doesn't get relayed inappropriately, the vast majority of these do not need to be treated. So, like, you're you know, right. You're you know, right. You you had a different clinical scenario facing you. The, the the pressure was like going from 160 to 110 without any reasons, and you know this this movement of the heart that you don't think it's as vigorous as it was like at the beginning, it just seems that the heart is a bit stiff. Everything is stiff, the, the, the heart movement is different. There's no other way to describe it. It's just, you look at the heart, it just looks stiff. Yeah. It doesn't uh, look. I wanna make a couple comments to the audience because everybody's, everybody's congratulating you, Stefan, and, I'm, and, and, and you, we've known each other a long time, so you'll understand where I'm going with this, which is, I'm glad it worked. I'm glad the patient did okay. That doesn't mean you actually made a good decision. It just means that it worked out. And yep. I, you know, I, we all know of cases where we did the exact same thing and it worked out actually the wrong way. Exactly. So I think for, for everybody out there, we tend to get into this, well, the patient lives, so we did the right thing. Well, maybe that's true. And sometimes as Billy, we've talked about this, right? Sometimes people die, even though we did all the right things. So. I think we need to be framing these conversations and I really appreciate your honesty about, I don't know if I made it worse or better and I don't want to have it because I think we all struggle with this. Hey, Jamie, I'm sure you've been listening while you've been writing your clinic notes. So I want to actually hey. ask you, so the the septum is also a big deal when we're doing, when you're doing all these, you know, mitral stuff, right? All these TMVRs or SAM and there's outflow and you guys are doing septal ablations and, I mean, how much of an issue is the septum as we deal with some of these things? Is it something we should be way more worried about? Is it something we should be doing less of? I mean, what's your concept of, about sort of septal hematoma, LV outflow tract obstruction? Because you deal with it probably more than we do because of the TMVR work you do. Well, I'm uh, I'm bringing in I'm bringing Stefan in next time I need to make some space for a valve and Mac. Um, he's uh, is you are you are not quite basal enough for me there, uh, Stefan. But it was not bad. Um, so pretty good job there. No, I you know we obviously and, and I'm sure Billy's doing this or has done this plenty too. We're infarcting the septum in various uh, controlled ways, particularly at at the basal septum. Um, but I, you know, I think that the the intermyocardial the the muscular hematomas are, as you mentioned, um, they're just a black box, and I um, I find them terrifying. We've obviously had a number of them, and have not always handled. I mean, I don't. I just don't know what to do and most of the time, and they particularly in the older frail people and you get that kind of boggy free wall of the RV. It's less the septum, but sort of more that RV free wall just looks edematous and they don't do that well. Um, so I don't know what to do with those people and I would love anybody's input. Um, I also wanted to note earlier, Robert um, mentioned um, that you'd have to push him down a hill uh, to do something. And I just it's important to me to note uh, to Robert that it's not hard to push someone downhill. Um, you, it's hard to push you up a mountain, not down a mountain. Um, so just nice. for as an FYI, I am paying attention. All right, so that, that actually is a perfect lead. So Stefan, what I wanna do is I'm, I'm gonna have Stefan stop sharing and we're gonna have Robert present the next case. Um, and Stefan, there's a bunch of stuff in the chat room, I think in regards to your case. I think it'd be great if you took some time to help answer some questions for people. Sure. Um, but so again, I, I think this proves a lot of things that we're, that we're trying to get to, which is this is what we need to do more as a profession, which is, listen, this is not all fun and games. There's a lot of bad stuff that can happen. And I think we can all learn a lot from each other. And, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'll say for myself, as I spend more time in a cath lab going, I don't know what the hell to do because I don't know what right is. You know, should I stent it? Should I not stent it? Should I stent all of it? Should I stent part of it? Should I DCP it? Should I coil it? Should I not coil it? Should I reverse it? I, I almost feel like every year I've been going along in this profession, I know less. Um, 
Robert, as you get ready to share, I'll ask Billy. I mean, Billy, you've been doing this, Stefan's doing it. I'll stick to you, Billy. You've been doing this as long as I have. Do you feel more confident about what you're doing now or less confident or, or where are you with all this? It's like one of those things, the more you learn, the more you know that you don't know. So, and the more times you run into these experiences. I mean, you, you know, my dad always said for years that, you know, don't have one, don't have 10 one-year experiences, have, you know, one 10-year experience. And I think, you know, you, you reflect on these cases a lot uh, and sharing them with people you, that you trust and respect that to give you input like this, I think is fantastic. I think one of the things I'd ask you, because you're probably the only one on the panel, I would bet you that has the experience of doing it. We talk about unroofing these and, and opening them up, you know, if it, if it was causing, you know, chamber compromise, how do you do that? You know, I, I've talked about it. We've looked at it. We've looked at cases that friends have sent me from around the country and I say I'd unroof it, but, you know, I've not done it. And so, and, and that gives you an idea. <clears throat> I've had my fair share of septal hematomas. I've had my fair share of RV dry tamponade type of scenarios like this. And, but I've not done anything dramatic to treat them. But suppose you had one that was really compromised in a chamber. What, what's going to be your step-by-step -step approach to actually unroof one? So wire into it, Corsair into it, or microcatheter into it. Uh, you could try a jacket wire to see if you can just shove it into the space but if not it's a stiff wire into the ventricle and then it's a but if the corsair doddering it isn't enough to relieve it it's a 3-0 or 4-0 balloon to open the thing wide open to drain it just I mean, the other the other option is what you have to do is go in probably with more than a fine cross side catheter but something that can really aspirate and you have to aspirate the crap out of it get it almost as dry as you possibly can, and then coil it. Um, I don't know which is the right way. They both have pluses and minuses, but you, the, the one thing you can't do is leave it. And I think as Stefan showed, I think I'm gonna guess Stefan's big win was he did it earlier than later. Um, I think that once they get compression, things become a lot more difficult to deal with. So. The only thing I know about that, Bill, is t talk a little bit about aiming for the ventricular chambers as opposed to, you know, some of those distal septals. Sometimes, you know, you don't always know if you're headed to the pericardium, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they become epicardial. That, uh, that was my case. Yeah. I think you, you, I mean, I think you got to think long and hard. I mean, I, it, is you almost want to take like the stiff wire with a really long bend come way up on the septal and work away from the, the I would want to do it from the LAD, not from the right. Yeah. I want to do it higher up to yep. make sure that I'm not on the, you know, not on that basal portion that runs along the bottom, but I'm on the vertical portion that's running up the LAD and you need a big long bend and you'd be, and, and to be honest, it doesn't matter where the wire goes, you just want to get there and then you take your microcatheter in and you're probably going to need to inject contrast in it to prove that you're in a chamber, not an extravascular space. And it's terrifying. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's the, I think everybody needs to realize watching this, right? If you're, if, if you're doing PCI right now and you're comfortable, I think you're batshit crazy because you know, it, a lot of bad things can happen and you got to be able to manage. And I think that for me is the more I've done high risk PCI, the more the mental challenge for me is super hard and super hard to manage. Um, and it's probably why this is a younger person's game. Cause I think as you get older, fear, fear starts to overcome, uh, some of the stuff you can do. Bill, so, yeah. Bill, on the chat, there's a, there's a good question. One is uh, from a good friend of mine from Australia, uh, from Australia, uh, Rusan Datov. He's asking, you know, nowadays, what do we have? Because I, 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 I put Ilal coils, um, but now, nowadays I would use all 14 coils. So what, what are you guys using currently in your lab? O14 right away? Is it what you guys doing most of the time? 
when yeah, I used well, I used fat thrombin and 014 coils. Robert? I'm still using 018 tornadoes. Do you hate it? It it was a it was a cost issue. I mean, it's not great to have to switch out MCs, right? Like I still right. that you, part sucks. So if you had a 14 coils, you'd want a one force. Hundred percent. There's no question. If I can leave my microcatheter right there and not have to exchange out, yeah, of course I would. You know, the the problem my is my cath up director is that... better than your cath up director. That's all I can say. Yeah, I I do the purchasing decisions, so thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, it's not anyway. That's neither here nor there. All right. So, um, and yes, by the way, Jamie wins because I, you know, yeah. Jamie. Here's the thing. So as for so that people know, Jamie taught me for a long time and, and still does as evidenced by about five to 10 minutes ago, he called these <laughs> learning opportunities and allowed me to pick myself back up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that, continue to work on that. Yeah. Um, so, so Robert, why don't we, why don't we get you go on? I just, A, Rustam, yeah. Stefan, great to see you all. I think um, it, it's not whether an 014 coil is better than an 018 coil, is better than fat, is better than from, and is better than spheres. I think it's really important to understand all of them and they all potentially have a role in different situations. Mm -hmm. And with that, Robert, why don't you lead us on yeah. to a different kind of problem, which is managing gear entrapment. So we're gonna get stuff stuck in a coronary. Yeah. I'm sure that's never happened to anybody. Um, yeah, and I just wanna reemphasize one point that I think Nicholson made that might be one of the most important points. You gotta know what the etiology is, right? So if it was an outflow obstruction and you coiled it, you're in trouble. If it's dry tamponade from an epicardial perf, that's a different story. So I just think, and whether you want to inject affinity, whether you want to do it with, you know, however you want to do it, I just think, honestly, uh, you know, I think Nicholson just reoriented a little bit of my thinking on that. So I just, I appreciate that, Nicholson. All right. So um, we're going to talk real quick about getting crap stuck. I did a couple cases that weren't crazy because not everybody on here is CTO operators. And sometimes I think stuff gets a little too crazy and I just wanna make sure we all learn. And then there's some awful stuff. So we'll just kind of like see what everybody wants to do because uh, I've had my fair share of, of feeling stupid and doing stupid stuff. So in terms of it, you know, entrapment algorithms, I just wanna call everybody's attention to, you know, uh, Bill and a couple of folks a couple of years ago had this idea to, to try and put together uh, in writing, what we had been trying to do as a community with this complications course, you know, is um, Bill's brainchild. And, and a lot of people really put a lot of work into that. Jamie was a big integral role in that as well. And um, so putting this down into algorithms so that we can learn, you know, I think when I was a chip fellow and I would see Jamie and Bill do all this stuff and I would try and contextualize and, and put those things and how would I do this the next time and really starting to put together some if this, then that's really helped me sort of with that. And so I think these algorithms for anybody that wants to get into the high risk game. There's just no, there's no substitute for when things get crazy. And sometimes it's hard to think straight, even when you've done it a lot, having these in the back of your mind and having some process metrics to go through is really clutch. So I just wanted to kind of call that out. Um, we're gonna talk about stents uh, real quick. I'm gonna show the stent case. Um, you know, this is the, the, the algorithm. You can see the first thing is, is, is your wire through it. And like anything lost, if you can keep wire position key, if not, then there's lots of other things that we can kind of talk about. The other thing is, it's not just showing cases, but how do I prevent this, right? What are the things I can do? It's not just what happens if it happens. It's, oh God, how do I let this not happen? And that's, you know, knowing when you're in situations where it might happen. So tortuosity using guide extension tools, vessel prep, right? Vessel prep, vessel prep, vessel prep. You've got to get your vessels prepped. You're going to stent, you're going to strip stents, especially in calcified vessels. Um, making sure you stent distal to proximal, right? We all learned this in the interventional fellowship. It doesn't always work out that way. Hopefully that's pretty rare, but going through freshly deployed stents is a great way, even sometimes endothelialized stents is a great way uh, to strip gear and then having multiple wires and getting stuff trapped. Uh, so again, if you can anticipate the risk, you'll have to go back to these kinds of slides, hopefully less than you would. These are just a couple examples. Again, if your stent gets stripped off and you can deploy it, well, great. Sneak a small balloon in, slowly dilate up, go ahead and put the stent in place. Uh, there's also the old uh, getting a couple wires wrapped up around. This is having a wire through the end, taking a couple wires down past it and getting the radio to, uh, radio opaque floppy ends uh, kind of uh, twirled together in a knot. I actually learned this from a Berlacus video and actually had to do it once. You actually take a hemostat on the back of the wires once you get them there and just start spinning the hemostat and it actually will help you kind of create that knot. Um, 
Again, sometimes you can get a small balloon through if the stent's not in a place you want to get a track, inflate it and actually bring the stent back. Then there's all sorts of wicked things that we can put inside uh, of coronaries in the body in order to get these things out, everything from micro snares to end snares to biotomes. Uh, and then there's just crushing the stent out of the way. This is actually, oh, this is a picture of a, a, of a, of a, a colleague of mine who had to uh, crush the stent he stripped at the bend of the circumflex into the left main. Well, this person ended up coming in with refractory uh, stent uh, failure in this area and I ended up having to burr that out. So not all of these things are benign. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, um, but I can tell you drilling that crushed stent out of the way was not, not my favorite thing uh, that I did. So let's talk about a few cases so we can put this into practice. Again, you know, mine are more short tidbits uh, working through. Stefan's was like an amazing just array of a single case that really went through a lot of stuff. Um, this was a buddy of mine uh, doing a case. Uh, he drilled out uh, the prox uh, cert from the left main. Then he decided to stent that and he thought he was good. Then he took an angiogram and he was like, oh man, that OM1, I wanna go grab that. I'm gonna go stent that, okay? Unfortunately, the stent didn't go and you can see as he was trying to get stuff back, not only is there no wire here, but there's this little fun zone thing right here in the old stent that's stripped right off the balloon, there's no wire access. This is when, you know, you're in the other room and, and uh, typically in my lab, it's, hey, uh, we need you for a consult in room two. Like you're scrubbed in lead <laughs> and we need you for a consult in room two. Okay, cool. So you stop what you're doing, you go to room two and you see that. So I guess that's where I'll stop and sort of see, I mean, this stuff happens. I mean, this is just real life. This isn't, I was retrograde, externalized, trying to do, you know, trying to do a tip in in the arch because I couldn't get my R350 or RG3 down. This is, I was just doing PCI and I did something I probably shouldn't have. I didn't jailbreak my struts and I stripped off the stent. Um, so what do you guys think at this point? If, if you walk into the situation, what are you going to do? Am I muted? Are you muted? No one's speaking. That's fine. I can just keep what going. What would you do? Never muted, Rob. <laughs> Oh God, have I been just talking to myself for the last 20 minutes? Because so, so, I'm not so, that technologically savvy. So you've got a stent stuck. Has your wire come back? Are you out? Are you, are you, is your wire so, still in the stent or not? Through so the, he still had his original wire down the circuit. He sent it across, but the wire into the OM is gone. So him pulling it back, it popped, I mean, just from the port, popped the stent delivery balloon and the wire back out and left the stent in there. You know, I think, I think at this point, you just forget about the... Uh, Forget about the OM, get a wire the side and just crush the stand on the wall. I mean, it's, this, this would be the, the less even full uh, situation. You can try to, get the, the other issues, like if you want to really get the stand out, you can do it and snare it and everything, but you probably, you already have an impeller in, you will have to go ping pong wire beside it so you don't lose everything if you want to snare it. But I think the safest, if you were with an impeller, because you were worried about uh, what you were doing, I would keep it simple and just crush it on, on the wall. That's what I would do. I think one, one okay. point to make with this though is when you lose a stent like this, and this happens to all of us, it's imperative to keep your wire. I mean, if you keep your wire, you know, John Douglas, one of my you know mentors and heroes, you still always say you have to play them where they lie, like golf. And, you know, if you if the stent's in place there and you've kept your wire, you know, you can just gradually put a 1015 balloon through it, you know, start expanding it and just play it where it lies. And once you've lost it, you know, you, you're, you're, once you've lost your wire, you, you're pretty hosed at this point. You don't have a lot of options. And, and, uh, and the, the world's gotten really worked up about these 1.5 side branch vessels. I, I maintain my ability to ignore them. So, I wouldn't have gotten into this to begin with, but I mean, I think, uh, you know, if, if you're going to treat it, I think Stefan's right. You're talking about crushing it up against the wall at this point. I'll say just one tidbit. It's always hard on one angio. So there is a couple millimeters sticking out the left main into the aorta. If that happens to change anyone's thought process, I just, if you can't see it, I know it's just this, you know, it's a quick couple uh, that's, that's, frames. That's nice though, because that makes snaring it a little bit easier. You know, so you can you can run a snare up over wire that just uh, uh, and loop it over. Struts would be in the in the order. It's I, I, difficult I to see, you, but it, the the stent brand starts to make me think too, because if you've got 
a really open cell design and you grab the first couple of millimeters of that stent, start yanking, you, you're, you have one of two events gonna happen. You're gonna have 40 millimeters of metal in the aorta or <laughs> it's gonna come out. So you become really committed to- Take it out. To, to that stent. So you, this is, as we talked about the airline thing earlier, right? All disasters are three mistakes. So you've made a mistake. It's the next two decisions that are gonna define whether this ends well or badly. And I don't know what's right. There's my son getting involved in our 150 people. Hi, Ryan. I say hi to Robert. Hey guys. Okay. Say hey, goodbye. Ryan. Bye. So the, the piece that I write is, it may be a brilliant move to go and stare that stent out, or it could be an utter disaster. But if you go to pull it out, you're committed to yanking it out. And I'm with Billy, which is, what were we thinking? I mean, <laughs> we, uh, first of all, you, I'm a DK crush guy for a reason, because doing culottes tends to end up being, end up like this. And there's these things called guide extensions, which help you avoid stuff like this. And earlier I was gonna to talk to Robert, which is, it is almost, I would bet 90% of stuck stents are in a circ. It's a calcified circ because the angle and the calcium sort of ends up. And you got to remember the reason the stent stuck is you pull the strut off the balloon. So this you've got a you got a fish hook with a barb sitting there. So getting it out can be an issue, at least in my opinion. So what happens? All right. So the deal was I kind of stared at it and I thought, you know. I don't know if I want to stent this across because it's a newly freshly deployed stent. And I'm going to crush this out of the way. I wonder if I can get this thing out before I commit myself to that, especially because there's a few millimeters sticking out into the aorta. I just didn't feel great about that, although I knew yeah. it was certainly an option. Um, and then I thought, well, how do I want to get this thing out? Because now it's off the wire. I thought about getting some uh, micro snares and doing that whole bit. But the thing is, wherever I go, my little cart follows me, my little CTO cart that happens to have certain things on it. I'm just really used to using an ensnare. So I was like, hey, why don't you just bring me an ensnare and let's just see what happens. Because for me, I'm like, there's three loops. I'm not good enough to get it with one loop, but three loops, that really ups my odds. So I just spun it around in the left main, uh, was able to grab it. Uh, cinch in on it with the uh, guide, as you can see there on the left, and just start pulling. And it started coming. This was, I'm not going to lie, a little scary, just to be super straight with you. Um, did did and you pull it, the circ wire with it, knowing you were going to lose access? Sure did, because I knew that I had flow down there and it had been freshly stented. And so I didn't really, I wasn't worried, right? Like I could rewire that if, if worse came to worse. And I wasn't going to drag it across anything that was unstented, you know, like really rough it up. Again, this is all just, I think this should work and be okay ended up popping out. What it did was I drug it into the guide and then I took one of my trapper balloons up beside it and blew it up just to pin it. Cause I, I just kept thinking, <laughs> you know, I hate to do something dumb, like get this in, get it out and then lose it somewhere. So I just trapped it inside the guide um, and then pulled the entire system out and then um, uh, went from there. Now I'm not gonna lie, he went back and stented this and I got the film, that's fine. Uh, Cause at that point I was like, you know what, I'm good. Um, he went, I was just like, just just jailbreak the stent struts next time with an appropriately sized balloon, which he did, which is fine. That's, you know, whatever. Um, oh, so that's the case. Did you deliver the stent without actually ever jailbreaking the stent? I was in like a 2-0 balloon, you know, and then you're trying to take a 2-5 long stent through. And typically that just, you know, doesn't lend itself to, uh, to good results as evidenced uh, on the left side of the screen. Let me ask you, let me ask Jamie too. Um, that, that's your cue to turn around. Um, Stop working on notes. Suppose, suppose you uncoiled it, like you like you described, Bill. So you so you pulled on it, it, it wouldn't release. You uncoiled it, and you made this mess of a stent hanging out the the left main into the aorta. You know, which which I would think about us still flashing it then maybe and and trying to pin it. But uh, you guys snorkel stents all the time now, with protecting you know you know at risk coronaries when you're doing Tavar. Actually, what, what's do this? we snorkel this stents all the time now, Jamie? Well, you guys are doing basilica and everything that you should be doing, but <laughs> most of the little snorkeling stents. So, is there? Do you know anything about like what's the 
outcomes or what's the, the, the sequela of leaving a stent hanging? I mean, they hanging 20, 30 millimeters of stent out the left main up the aortic arch. And uh, this would be in the worst case scenario, nothing near that, but uh, you guys have experience doing this. I don't know that there's any long-term data on snorkel stents. Um, we I, anecdotally have had one snorkel stent from many years ago come back with ISR that was a real pain in the ass, but we were able to fix. Um, that's, um, but uh, whether or not you, you think know, it leads to thrombosis, like I mean, have you seen any issues where the the stent? I, I haven't. I mean, we are not, as Bill kind of mentioned, we're not doing a lot of snorkeling right now, but. Um, it's a little weird to understand how you can get ISR of a snorkel stent since there's no endothelium around the snorkel stent to generate in stent recent, like there's nothing, no endogenous factors when it's just floating in the sinus. So it's a little, I don't even know how she got ISR, but she did. In any event, the, it like crept up from the coronary or something. I, I mean, with this case, I think if it's hanging way out, you know, one interest, if you could, if you had it snared and that was why you've extended it out a pretty far away, it would be interesting to send a guide extender over the snare and try and intersusep the, the, you know, the extended That's cool. um, stent and, and see if you can just kind of wedge it out as you extend the guide extender into the coronary. Um, you, you know, that would be a bit of a, um, it's uh, a, a really interesting yeah. thought. I'm just thinking yeah, worst scenario, if you had the piece of stent that you uncoiled, pulled out, you know, could you not just re-stent the left main osteal flash and have a remnant of stent hanging out in the aorta? I mean, it's certainly no less than your Medtronic valve that you put in. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if that's the optimal thing, but I think that's what you have to start thinking about doing. Um, I think I would just put a pitch in for Basilica, which is if there's if there are Tavera operators watching or your centers do TAVR, you don't put a stent in and drop a valve. Put a guide extension into the left main and do it that way because then you don't risk stripping the stents off. But people, you know, putting stents in and jailing them is just, that's part of what we're learning about complications is how do you avoid them? Okay, if you're gonna put a TAVR valve in and you don't wanna do Basilica, put a guide extension in the corner to protect it, not a stent, because you'll be able to still deliver the stent and you eliminate the risk of stripping the stent off because you didn't need it and you pull it out through a bunch of metal. I, I think the, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So, so it's, it's not it, just, it gets, it gets better. It's not just in tavern procedures. I wasn't going to show this case because there's other way cooler stuff, but my buddy called me into the room a few years back and said, hey, I was deploying this osteo RCA stent and they coughed and the stent came way back and I can't get back in. And I was like, okay, that seems bad, right? Here's the root shot and this is the, this is the osteum and there's like, I don't know, 10 or 15 millimeters of stent out here. And he said that when he, you know, he was like, it, it was underdeployed and I can't, I, I can't get back in. So I did all the normal stuff. I tried to free wire it. I tried to do all of that stuff with a bunch of different guides. I tried to snare it. I tried all this stuff. Nothing would work. And I felt like a jerk. And then I thought, let me just shoot the left system and see, see what had happened. And so I shot the left system and it must have been underdeployed because there's different collaterals. So I was like, well, I guess I could just go retrograde and try and get this thing. So I just went down the septals and actually was able to wire uh, up through the stent with a Xeon black wire, was able to then take my microcatheter up through and then just grab an R350 up in the, the root. It was a little tricky pulling on the wires and getting you know a guide to, to, to sit out here. I could still, even railing on the wire, only get a guide to get sort of close. Then I'm going to be honest, I was like, I don't totally know what to do do here, but I guess I'm going to run an IVIS catheter down and, and just optimize the stents, right? I mean, that's what else am I, I'm not going to re-stent this. So I ended up just uh, running an IVIS catheter down. The good news is, is he had just put the stent in, so I knew what its postal capabilities were without fracturing it. Uh, just ran some big balloons down. And you can see here, it's like, you know, I mean, it was, it was hard to even take angiography. So I hope, I hope it's as Jamie says, I, you know, this is 18, 20 months ago, and I haven't heard anything, but 
um, I really hope this person doesn't come back. Um, Honestly, that's one where you wish almost the wire would go out a stent strut and you could crush it to the side and do what Bill was talking about, which is Austin flash it, mush it down, and yeah. reset the ostium appropriately because yeah. the next person who has to cast this person is probably <laughs> unlikely to actually cast it. I know. I know it's so terrible. I felt so bad about it. I didn't really know what else hey. to do. Um, so, anyway. So Billy, before you go on to this next, actually maybe switch back to Stefan. Robert. Yeah, do you want to go to Stefan? Yeah, I don't want to but take up too much time. I want to ask Billy a question because somebody was bringing up. So obviously, it, you know, this came up re recently for me. I got called by a guy at another hospital locally you know, he's, you know, someone locally, they're doing an RCA CTO. They make two perforations, probably out the ends of acute marginals. Patient gets tamponade, they drain it. They're still leaking. They ask me what to do. I suggest that they coil the vessel because um, you can still open a corner after coiling it. And they had made a big mistake. And the, the next challenge for them is they had to call the interventional radiologist to teach them how to coil the right corner. So, you know, Stefan's talking about coiling, Jamie's talking about coiling, Nicholson, you're talking about coiling, I talk about coiling, but most interventional cardiologists are not trained how to coil. So how do we teach these, how do you teach people to coil? So Billy, how do you teach an interventionalist coil? Where would they learn it? How do they do it? What do you do? That's a great question. You know, I think, again, most of these problems you need to have thought out. You know, it reminds me so much of early on during my career, I was doing, I did a lot of structure on the PFO ASD closures and stuff, and I always wondered how I was going to get an ASD device when it embolized back. I sat at home in my sink, you know, snaring an ASD device into a guide and learning how to cut the guide so I could re recapture it through there. A lot of this stuff's pre-preparation, uh, but, you know, we also have colleagues that have a lot to offer. And, you know, I think if you can develop a good relationship with your interventional radiology colleagues, your neurointerventional colleagues, uh, you know, they, they have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this. And I think to go spend time there uh, and, 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 you know, kind of leverage their experience and their knowledge is, is invaluable. I, I will see. Go ahead, Robert. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, when I got to my current institution um, and we ended up, um, you know, that question kind of came up. My colleagues who I was doing cases with were like, hey, how do we learn how to do that? And I was like, oh, I can show you. So when we were doing, you know, they'd have a degenerating graft. I'd be like, oh, well, you don't you don't want to stent that. Let's just treat the native and then let's just, just cool coil that thing and have fun. So, you know, that was a great intro on several different cases to learn how to coil you know, the whole, you know, treating the other vessel, taking the balloon down to the anastomotic site, just in case something floats downstream, just so you have control, you know, where do I put them, finding a good lesion to make sure that, you know, so the coils will stick, right? And that was a really safe way to kind of screw around and sort of say, oh yeah, what's it like to get this microcatheter there? How do I size my coils correctly? And, oh, I do need to go bigger than I think. And uh, this is the type of wire, you know, because it's, it's not the coil pusher, right? Like we use a and uh, a platinum plus 018 and all these different things. And, and, and we were under no time crunch, right? Nobody was dying, nobody was sick. And we could just sit there and kind of work through that. So I do think if people, you know, have the opportunity to fix natives and then coil degenerating SVGs, it's nice because there's already a lesion, right? So you already have somewhere to stick the coils. The person's not gonna get sick. You know, you're under no time crunch. And, and I, I just think that that's a really lovely way to kind of learn how to do that. So, so you would call that something like purposeful practice? which is open the native and we're gonna use this as an opportunity, whether it needs to happen or not, as an opportunity to teach people how to do something. And for, for people, fellows in training at centers that don't have faculty that know how to do it, or people in their early career, what you say is open the native and then have an interventional radiologist come and teach you how to do it in the graft. Would that be a reasonable thing? I mean, I think that's a great idea because they're doing this all the time. I mean, the case that if I end up showing the next case, I totally brought my interventional radiologist in because I know he's amazing. And there was just something I couldn't get out. And I was like, hey, man, can you show like I, I'm struggling? Like, can you help me? And so I just think finding somebody with a better skill set than you, you know, and having them teacher, like you said, is invaluable. Okay. So, Stefan, can you show us the next case? We're, uh, we're going to, yeah. unfortunately, I know we're going to run out of time tonight. We're supposed to only go 90 minutes, but. Got, these are fun conversations. I, uh, we got 
127 people here. I hope everybody's enjoying it. But um, Stefan, you want to show us another uh, case and we can chat a little bit more and hopefully learn some more stuff. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, so this case is, uh, is a case from 2011. You'll see that things. Uh, hey, Stefan, do, do you know how to fix normal arteries or do you just do CTS? I, I have, I've sort of forgotten how to fix uh, <laughs> type A lesions. Uh, no, the point is, uh, okay. you're, uh, the, uh, it, it, but you're right. I mean, uh, this, this you, uh, the more you do post cabbage cases, the more you understand of how these cases are sometimes just not, not even under the radar of most operators. So uh, people don't, don't understand how challenging they can be. And we help them so much by doing a, a bit of extra work until we make them sicker. And this is an, ex an example of when I made one sicker, but fortunately it got out of the problem. But they, it was 71 year old, post cabbage, Rima LED Lima OM, very pertinent, two IMAs, and an SVG to the RC. As long as you put in there an SVG, it's going to be one that's going to go down, and that's the SVG that went down. It's got an RC CTO. It's got two arterial grafts, and it's still in uh, New York Heart 3-4, three, uh, three, poor quality of life, and I hope I'm asked to open the RC CTO. And this is a dual retrograde injection, Lima OM, and, and so there's two radials, one the left main, one the Lima, you can see that there's a cardiac collateral torches into the AV groove, which nowadays we've learned they're not the ones we would like to take. And there's a bend and a osmosis on the Lima to the OM right there. And a, quite a good epicardial collateral right there. So let's see the early days of ADR cross busting ray. It's a short CTO. And in the, was the early days where we would boss early, right? Boss first or last. Well, we, we've under, I think we now understand that it's cross boss last, not first. So a bit of cross boss work and ended up with the perforation of the, the, the vessel. So I decided to just go retrograde on this case. And because of the two bends on the OM. Well, Stefan, so you just perfed. You've got a stain in that vessel. Yeah. Why'd you keep working? Because I, my objective is just to get retrograde to try to do a dissection and the section flap that would seal that perforation. So, so, so you, just, you didn't think it would become that big an issue quickly. So you no. had time to keep working. And that's, that's a good point. I thought that this perforation was not that high uh, rate and was relatively proximal in the RCA that just gives me some time. But again, I'm early in my experience. I could have okay. been burned with this. Okay. So try to get them to the OM. And because of the two bends right there, as soon as I get a micro catheter to get here, the guy is super ischemic because he got no retrograde flow to the, to the circ, no, no, and I abort the case. And then I have this brain fart. And uh, uh, to, to, to go for this epicardial collateral with a fielder FC, because it's the best wire you can have at that time. And you know what's going to happen afterward. The nice thing is it looks like it's perfed already. So that's good. Yeah. So boom, it's perfed. And you can see some contrast here. So what you see right now is a coil. I have coiled everything. So I want to turn to to the, the panel, you know what's happening. Do you think it's enough what I've done? Or do you have to think about something else when you've coiled the inflow of an uncrossed epicardial collateral? Robert, you're shaking your head. What are you thinking, buddy? So bad, because you know it's from the other direction too. <laughs> this is the worst because you're already freaking puckered up and you've got something one way and you know you've got to come the other way one way or the other um so that's fun yeah so that's why these are the worst 
these are the worst because you don't have a wire, you've not crossed the CTO, and to get to the other end of that collateral will be a challenge if you've already tried the other routes and they were difficult. So this is the shot from the rebound and you can, you can see it's bleeding right where we don't like it to be, okay? And I already tried to get through this all the way here and he got really sick. But what I decided that he would get really sick because there was no other way. So I got it into it, reverse card. And then afterward was able to open up the right. I got there, you can see it's still bleeding, but you absolutely have, you're committed to success at this point. You have to open the CTO to be able to, to stand. And I was able to stand the right, seal the whole thing, but just, so this is just the, the case that I wanted to share, but it's so That's ballsy. The two I mean cases, that is some good. The so the two cases I showed it's collateral perforation and post cabbage patient. It can be lethal, dramatic. I think quick management of the bleeder is necessary in most cases. You have to do, there's a big, big algorithm. Like if you have a wire across the collateral, which means that it's most of the time a micro catheter induced perforation, it's much easier to coil because you still have control on the collateral. It can come from either side or distal to proximal and then you can coil the whole thing and you're good. If there's no wire across the collateral, this is when, if you perf with a wire and not with a microcatheter, these are the worst of the worst cases. Coiling the mm -hmm. inflow will not be in. You have to coil the outflow of the collateral. And therefore you got your, you really have to bite the bullet and get the RE open. So, uh, the best is to prevent it. So key or message, make, make, make sure from cases I showed that septal channels are actually in the septum. When you're surfing very distal septal connection, they may have connections that are a bit weird or a big junction of RV, LV, and they can be close to epicardial. And if you have a choice between crossing more basal septals to more epicardial septals, choose the more basal, it's always safer. Avoid, so, avoid high risk AV groove collateral. We've learned that over time. This is a, two, a case from 2011. Nowadays, there are minimal place for wires, I think other than SUO and Sion Black for epicardial. And the whole question that comes is that case, come on, it was, it was a short CTO that long, I should have started that vessel in that first stenting versus do you commit yourself to the full hybrid approach given all the risk that pertains to it? And then nowadays I would have done it 10 years later, I would have done this case very differently. Would have never approached this AB group collateral even with a SUO. And I would have managed to deal with my brave perforation, integrate with another dissection, integrate. I would have based that vessel, get another dissection plane and get this going, integrate. So I'm just, it's, this is, we, we have the, we, we have like at some point, like the ch chance or whatever, the bad luck to have learned from our mistake and being there from 10 years. And that's the reason why we're here to share with others. And so they can learn from our, uh, from our experience and what we did in the old days, but crossing my first ever CTO case, I crossed an epicardial in the post cabbage over an RV, a coal branch with a pilot 50. I mean, this is, this is close to being clueless of what the risk were at that time, but it was in the early days Pilot 50 was supposed to be like an FC or whatever. I got it through, I got it the case done, it went well. 
But the thing is that nowadays, if I look at that case, I would never do it the same. Let me, let me ask you something. Said, Billy, so looking at that, right, how much has your approach to apocardials changed in the last three years? Yeah, it, it definitely has. I mean, I think you, you've led the, the charge on this and understanding that epicardials, particularly in post-bypass patients, can be exceedingly dangerous. And I think looked at other less, uh, you know, risky strategies for it with STAR and so forth. And, and I think, again, you know, the thoughts that you have on this lead the, the, the field repeatedly. And so I guess one of the questions I'd ask, you know, that, that is, is probably more germane to the audience here, and, and I'd be interested to hear Bill and, and, and Rob's thoughts on this. You know, Stefan's one of the best operators in the world. It's no mistake. That's why I recruited him to come here. You know, he managed to get across this eventually and, and get in a position where he could treat this from both ends. But what are you going to do if you can't? I mean, you know, which is a real possibility for the vast majority of people out there. And, you know, you've got to bleed from both sides. Are you comfortable then as saying, look, I sealed one side, I'm going to pull and tap and give protamine and keep suctioning blood and hope that it auto tamponades? Are you going to, wh wh where are you go in this case if you can't get across? Because I think whenever you have complications in CTO PCI, I think the number one way that we treat them is getting across the, C the CTO so you can do all the, the therapeutic measures that you're going to make. But suppose you can't. So what do you do here? In this situation, he's created. Uh, go Robert, go ahead. Oh no, 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 not at all, Bill. No, I would like you to. I'm gonna. We're, we're gonna run out of time, so I have a couple of comments once you get done. So sure. I'd like you actually to answer the question. I think it'd be helpful. So first and foremost, this perforation in a post cabbage patient is in a very dangerous location because it's on the poster lateral aspect, and that infralateral poster lateral segment is often where there's retained pericardium because if you think about where that is in the, the chest cavity the surgeon literally has to lift the heart up out of the cavity in order to get to that area. So that's why there's often retained pericardium there. And so perforations in that segment can be really dangerous because you can't tap them. Uh, they're very difficult to get to percutaneously and they could certainly lead to localized tamponade, which can be a, a real beast to get to. So first and foremost, if you have a perforation in the circ or posterior lateral area like that, you need to call your surgeon right away because there's a chance if you can't deal with it, Integrate and retrograde that you're going to have a real problem in your hands and you've got to know right away. Number two is maybe you can tap it, but maybe you can't. And that's where obviously getting echo in as soon as you can. And, or if you have to obviously do what you got to do and just tap it. But I, I think regardless, if you're a fantastic operator like Stefan, or you're just some Joe like me, you've got yeah. to get, you've got to get a couple things in place up front. I don't call my surgeons for every perf. I don't call my surgeons for hardly any perfs, but I will tell you in a post cabbage patient, the infralateral aspect, I'm calling my surgeon, I'm having somebody call my surgeons as soon as I start doing whatever I'm doing. Because again, that's an area where it's just hard for us to treat percutaneously. Um, and I just, I always worry a scotia about that particular location. But I think, but I think that what Bill is asking as a question is very, very, no, I haven't been in a situation where um, the other edge of the collateral is not controlled. Uh, I think you have to sort of think about controlling the bleeder uh, on the other side, if it's collateral that gives this and support the patient. Maybe, you know, if I hadn't been able nowadays, I would be able to, to go and cross. It might be might be a place where you have to actually uh, uh, control the bleeder from the other source of collateral that feeds that. But you know, you never know. Like I could have coiled that collateral that I actually crossed to get the right open. That might have been. That might not have been enough to control the bleeder. Uh, so I read these cases. That's very very difficult. But you gotta get something going. And you and nowadays, I would say, if you don't have anything, just start to help all of that vessel and get as distal as you can. But you got to start the vessel to just shut off everything that's mm -hmm. coming to integrate. You have to shut anything all the way to those branches and make sure that at least either you penetrate and you fenestrate, or you've you flap you've you've put a flap over it. I think it's something like this you have to do. So uh, we're, we're going to run out of time. First of all, just 
everybody, thank you so much for sharing a lot of emotionally enriching stuff, very difficult. There's a bunch of stuff in the chat and I'm gonna take the opportunity to make a few comments just based on my own personal experience. So um, I don't think we're gonna see epicardial collaterals go completely away. I think STAR is a useful therapy. I think it solves a lot of issues, but I do not think we have all of the solutions for anatomic ambiguity proximally that we need, which means you're gonna to have to do retrogrades once in a while and every once in a while, that means you're gonna to have to go have cardio to do it. Mm -hmm. I think number two, the, the, the concern of protamine is gone, which is mm -hmm. giving protamine when gear is out of the coronary has no ischemic event. And so I think it's critically important is once you determine you're done, to give protamine in these cases 100%. is hugely important. We actually have published some data that showed a 50% reduction in tamponade and death by moving to that as a uniform therapy. I think the third comment I will make is, I actually think there is a great solution to left atrial compression. And we have that now solved. And we're going to do the complications course, which is for everybody out there, we're doing a two day. It's basically about 200 complications, very thematic, both structural and coronary and access. It, this year will be November 2nd and 3rd in Orlando, Florida, which happens to abut TCT. So hopefully some people can come to that. Should be very enriching. But one of the talks we're going to talk about is dealing with left atrial compression, so the post-cabbage patient. And our surgeons here at the U have found that most surgeons want to reopen the chest. So sub, they want to do a sternal opening in a post-cabbage patient because they're concerned of it still bleeding. But most situations with compression, both right atrial, right ventricle, and left atrium, by the time they get them open, the bleeding is stopped. And the reason being is the chamber is full and the, the blood basically auto, almost basically we do protamine. So for left atrial compression, one of our surgeons said, is it bleeding or not? I'm like, it's no way is it bleeding. You just need to get the clot out and we're okay. And so a left lateral thoracotomy is a 30 minute procedure for them to get in, open up, go in and pop the clot out. Single chest tube, it's about an hour opening the done in a post cabbage patient, no threat to the IMA, super simple, super quick. So we've now, in the last three years, we've done four. All of them have gone home within three days. And so I would just tell you is if you get left atrial compression, in a post-cabbage patient, it's a phone a friend to our surgeons, but it's a left lateral thoracotomy and a quick, simple way to do it. Um, it's 7.30, we've done 90 That's minutes. Really great. That's great to I just, there's 105 people left. Thank you all for taking the time. I hope you all thought this was useful, that you learned something and that it was valuable. Um, if you're more intrigued, you can follow the CRF website. We will be doing the complications course. It's two days, about 18 hours of talks on a variety of different complications. This year we'll be at the Hilton in Orlando, November 2nd and 3rd of budding TCT. And I would tell you, we'd love to teach you more, but there's a lot to do. But please don't hesitate to email, phone a friend, whatever it takes. And I will tell you from my own, Stefan, Robert, Bill, I appreciate you guys sharing. It's very emotionally challenging. And as always in these kind of opportunities, I've learned something that's gonna make me better at my craft. I really appreciate it. So thanks everyone and have a good night. Bye-bye guys. Thanks guys. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Nice.